This is Tim Connolly, a guy that was pretty well thought of as the leader of the front office of the Denver Nuggets before getting a massive deal, getting hired away to the Minnesota Timberwolves this past offseason, a team that already you could argue he's kind of ruined. Of course, I'm referring to the Rudy Gobert trade, a move that gutted the entire roster of valuable role players, young players, and future assets in exchange for a player that has not made them better in any real noticeable way. Now, I've talked about the Gobert trade before, and honestly, it's only gotten worse since, but the goal today is to focus on Tim Connolly himself. Because I've done videos before on GMs like this. I did a Billy King video about how he completely ruined the Nets. The Nets traded some players along with their 2014, 2016, and 2018 first round picks, all of which were unprotected. But Tim Connolly's story is arguably even more interesting, even if his tenure hasn't been as bad, certainly as Billy King's was. So let's look at Tim Connolly's time with the Nuggets. He was hired in 2013 in a very interesting situation. This was a Nuggets team that had some assets, had some young players, had some regular season success, and they were transitioning out of the Carmelo Anthony era. There wasn't a future MVP on the roster or anything, but there were some solid players and some assets, most of which they got in exchange for Carmelo Anthony. And the goal for Denver when they brought him in was to reach a, a higher level. They had a good regular season team. They had a team that had won 50 plus games, but they wanted top tier talent. They wanted to build through the draft and they wanted to create a consistent contender. And like I said, they were pretty well set up to do so outside of the big time star power. This was pretty uncommon at the time because even just nine or 10 years ago, there weren't really a lot of teams that were stockpiling picks and planning for the future like this outside of the very beginning of the process that had just started at the time in Philadelphia. And my point here is that it's not like the Nuggets were some kind of powerhouse franchise, but Connolly walked into a situation where he had a good amount of stuff to work with. He had a good foundation. And in his time with Denver, as I mentioned in the intro, he did a good job, slowly building from a mid 30s wins team to multiple successful playoff runs despite injuries to key players recently. But to understand the Gobert part of this and his rather short tenure so far in Minnesota, you have to look a little bit closer at his time in Denver. Let's start with the draft. In 2013, ironically, they selected Rudy Gobert with the 27th pick in that draft and ultimately traded him away for basically nothing. In 2014, they obviously did a fantastic job. Not only did he get Yusuf Nurkic and Gary Harris in the back half of the first round, useful NBA players, they ended up trading Nurkic later on once Nikola Jokic became the guy for them. They got better assets out of that. But of course, in the second round with a 41st pick in that draft, they end up with Nikola Jokic. It's the crowning jewel of any GM tenure that you could possibly have. He's the best draft pick of all time. You have to give him a ton of credit, not just for getting Jokic in that draft, but it was a good draft for them overall as well. Then you go to 2015 and they select Emmanuel Moutier seventh, who not only was a but played a lot for them and was one of the worst like high minute point guards the league has ever seen. Turn it around in 2016 though, they ended up with Jamal Murray with the seventh pick, which has turned out to be a fantastic selection. And then a little bit later in the back half of the first round, they ended up with Malik Beasley in that draft as well. Really solid job. Then in 2017, they selected Donovan Mitchell and traded him away for two first round picks, neither of which ended up being anything. So they're just giving the Utah Jazz great assets here, which as you guys know, uh, is not the first time he's going to do that. And then in 2018, they end up with Michael Porter Jr. with a 14th pick, who even though he's had injury concerns, he's on this big contract from a value standpoint and in terms of talent, that was a pretty good selection as well. And then if you want to, you could dock him a little bit for trading away Bol Bol because of how good he's looked in Orlando, but they just didn't really have a fit for him. They were trying to win games. They didn't have time necessarily to develop him. So I'm not really going to be too upset at him for that. And this is the NBA draft. Like, even though this is a little bit of an up and down record, you have to give the guy credit because he did get a lot of depth. He got a lot of role players and of course, selecting Jokic in the second round. You're going to miss on guys. Like it's going to happen. Nobody's going to be perfect. And you can certainly say this is a well above average job in the draft in his time in Denver because they ended up even having to trade away guys like Malik Beasley that were good NBA players. They just didn't have the minutes for him, nor did they want to pay him a contract that he was worth. And in terms of trades, there's two pretty significant ones that happened you know more recently here they brought in Jeremy Grant in exchange for a first round pick a guy that ultimately they lost in free agency but he was very good for them and then the Aaron Gordon trade where they didn't give up too much like RJ Hampton Gary Harris not too much there and he's been really impactful as well so overall this looks really good like his tenure in Denver looks good it seems like okay this is a guy that really knows what he's doing but there's two things here that need to be understood one even as good of a job as he did as a general manager building up this team it doesn't look anything remotely close to what it ended up looking like without Nicole Jokic. And yes, he gets a ton of credit for selecting the guy 41st overall second round pick, but also all the credit in the world goes to Jokic for developing into that kind of player. And if you just take Jokic out of this, it doesn't look nearly as impressive. Of course, that much is obvious, but it's it's important when you're giving this much trust and this much money and this much power to a guy 
that you're not just getting him because he ended up with Nikola Jokic, but uh, because of all the other stuff. And if you take Jokic away, the other stuff certainly looks less impressive. But the other part of this, the, the biggest part of this when you're trying to understand the Gobert trade and his time in Minnesota is this. All this smart stuff that he did in his time in Denver, these nice draft picks, two really good trades, none of that stuff has translated to Minnesota. And he has done the exact opposite of everything that made him successful in Denver in his very short time in Minnesota. There's just absolutely no connection between his time in Denver and now his time in Minnesota in terms of the moves that he has chosen to make. Denver was this incremental thing year after year. They were still trying to figure out their roster. They were just adding pieces, adding pieces, adding pieces. The Moutier thing didn't work out. Okay, here, let's go with Jamal Murray. Let's see how he works out. Michael Porter Jr., big swing in the, in, in the late lottery. Jokic, of course, in the second round, they figured out that he was the guy. They trade away Yusuf Nurkic. They bring in role player type guys like Jeremy Grant and Aaron Gordon in smart trades. They didn't give up a ton of value, but they got back guys that mattered and that helped their team. And then you get to Minnesota, and the only thing that he does is he trades away, you know, seven seven assets that actually matter to this group, whether it be future first round picks, whether it be role players on the roster, guys like Jared Vanderbilt that matter, that are good, that, you know, guard for you. Guys like Malik Beasley that he like he knows better than anybody that Malik Beasley is a good basketball player, trades him away, trades all these pieces away for one guy, a guy that's getting older, a guy that has a massive contract, and now you completely limit the future flexibility of the franchise as well. And we've gone over the Gobert thing over and over and over about how it didn't make sense at the time to try and go all in on a group that still had Anthony. Anthony Edwards, who is continuing to grow and develop and wasn't quite ready to be that guy yet, as great as he is, and the, and the questionable fit alongside Carl Anthony Towns. But the thing, the more I look at this, that just continues to blow my mind is as a member of the front office, as a leader of the front office, there is no precedent for Tim Connolly behaving like this as a leader of the front office or making moves like this. Everything was incremental. Everything was about building through the draft. It was about getting good role players. And immediately he just takes a massive swing, which to me brings up two questions. One, did he just get impatient because he went from a situation in Denver where, you know, if fully healthy, they would be competing for titles. They're one of the best teams in the league right now. And he goes to a Minnesota team that's a little bit more up and coming. And maybe he wants to just go ahead and make that move, make that swing, push them towards title contention because he wants to get there. He wants to win a title just as much as anybody else does. Or something I think is a little bit more likely, did he feel pressure from a new ownership group in Minnesota to make things happen quickly? Because the, if you look at the two situations and you understand how he built the team in Denver and the moves that were made and you know, the things that happened over here in Denver are what allowed him to earn this big contract, to come to Minnesota, to get all this money, to for everyone to think that he's doing such a great job. Those things are all over here. He does the exact opposite in his time in Minnesota. And the difference between these two situations is the ownership groups and a new ownership group at that in Minnesota that wants to make things happen quickly. They want to expedite the process. They want to be contenders immediately. And though that concept, that thought process aligns over here and makes that connection connection between the Gobert trade and his time in Minnesota in a way that just didn't exist with his time in Denver. Now, if you don't subscribe to that idea and you don't think that it was an ownership thing and you don't think that he completely changed his philosophy as soon as he got to Denver, well, then the argument has to be, was he ever actually that good of a leader of the front office in Denver? Like, yes, made some good selections. Of course, you got Porter Jr. You got Jamal Murray. You got guys like Malik Beasley. Uh, Nicole Jokic is the greatest draft pick ever. But if you take Jokic out of this, what does the team actually look like? Is Jamal Murray, you know, the the leader of a franchise the way that you would want him to be? Did he actually put together a good roster or did he just get blessed with having Nikola Jokic on the roster? Granted, he did select him 41st, but they had two other selections ahead of him in that draft they chose not to take him with. So obviously they didn't know he was going to become this MVP caliber player. And did, did Nikola Jokic and his brilliance more than anything else allow for this team to look better and ultimately the moves that Tim Connolly made? look better. Now, as is the case with most things, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Like when he goes to Minnesota, there probably is some pressure, whether it be internal or external, to push for a title and to contend and try and go out there and make a move. And also, he probably wasn't as good as maybe we all thought that he was in his time in Denver and making what is already one of the worst trades in league history immediately upon arriving to a new franchise, not only a new franchise, uh, but an up and coming franchise, a new franchise for him, but an up and coming team, a team that has, you know, a lot of potential and a lot of upward growth. Make Making that kind of a move immediately is going to be really, really tough to recover from. And it's it's even more mind blowing to look at it now because there's just no there's no connection. There's no precedent. Everything that made him successful as a leader of the front office in Denver, he's gone completely away from. So something has to have shifted. And it's it's a really interesting situation to look at and try and understand how you get there. And it also illustrates just how difficult this stuff can be. Getting this stuff right is not easy. And even though we got a lot of stuff right in Denver, 
Denver. Maybe he was a little bit overhyped and overrated in that sense, and maybe that's coming to light a little bit in Minnesota.